everyone, I'm GM Josh Cridell, and tonight I'm going to be going over a game which you should know by heart. Uh, now this is the title of the lecture, and I'm not taking it super literally, since I do, definitely do not know this game by heart, and luckily I have it on the screen so I don't have to, uh, but it's just a really great game, and it's one of those which, it, it's probably one you guys haven't seen. And it, just because it's not played by, you know, it's not played by a past world champion. It's not, you know, some super famous game that's in tons of books and all of this. So I figured it would be a game which most of you haven't seen, if not all of you. But just because it's not played by those players doesn't mean it can't be an amazing game. This is probably one of the most amazing games I've ever seen. And it just, not, it's not amazing necessarily because the level was super high or anything like this. I think white played really amazing and black could have probably played better, but at the same time made understandable errors in my opinion. Um, but it was just such a cool game because of how the whole thing happened. And also there was a cool feature, which is that literally every single piece of whites was sacrificed. And it's probably the only game I've seen where that happened. Every single piece was sacrificed. So that sounds like an, a, a massive exaggeration, but that's actually what happened in this game. So it's kind of a cool thing, and it's one which is great to do. Um, it was played by a friend of mine, uh, Greg Serper, who's a GM. He lives in Seattle now, hasn't played in a long time. But back in the 80s, 90s, he played quite a bit and was a, a pretty strong GM. Uh, this one was played in 1993 against a, a Greek GM called uh, Nicolaides. So this is the game Greg Serper against Nicolaides. Uh, Serper is white. So I'm going to pass through the opening fairly quickly. Um, not because it's not kind of interesting, but I just think that it's fairly standard and the most interesting part of the game definitely becomes later. So it was a King's Indian. Uh, Greg really likes this Knight GE2 system. It's kind of his pet system. It's one of those systems where if you don't exactly know what to do against it, it can be very tricky to face. And he knows those positions really well. Um, so he's had a lot of success with this system. Um, so black played knight bd7, knight g3. I would say if it's similar to any other system, it would be kind of similar to, a, um, to the F, early f3 systems. And you'll see why that is. Um, so a6, bishop b3. F3. So it's, it does look a little bit like the early F3 systems, the same-ish systems, because you get an F3 very early, the knight lands on G3. It looks at least somewhat similar. So black plays B5, and white pushes C5. So against B5, almost never do you take. You usually either ignore it completely or play C5. Occasionally you play A3 to keep B4 out, but I don't think B4 is such a big deal in this particular position. So c5 is pretty normal. Um, black takes it, plays queen c7. So fairly normal chess so far. Castles. And this is something which is also very typical, which is that after h4, white plays knight h1. I realize this knight is kind of laughable. You, I normally wouldn't recommend putting a knight here. But the point is that it reroutes immediately to f2. And it's actually quite good on f2. It controls the h3 push. It's ready to come into the center. So even though this knight looks horrifically ugly for one move, it comes right back in. So again, just explaining a few things happening in the opening. But personally, I kind of like white's position because I think these two pawns control the knight very well. This knight's ready to come out. White has clear ideas of playing queen d2, maybe trying to play on the d file. But OK, objectively, it's nothing too special yet. So black plays knight h5, a typical king's Indian type move, trying to do something on the dark squares. White played queen d2, not allowing knight f4, e5, knight f2. And believe it or not, after this next move, basically black just went downhill, downhill, downhill to the end of the game. And it's one of those where it looks like a pretty harmless move. Um, so in the game, black played knight f8, which again, looks like a normal move. You're trying to put the knight on e6, controls f4 and d4. Can't get much more normal than that, right? Um, I like knight f4 myself. 
put immediately putting the knight there, and you'll see why the knight would come in handy there in the game. Not to give you any subtle hints or anything. Um, so, knight f8 was played. And my first question to you is, how can white win the game by force? That's actually a joke because the game goes on a long, long, long ways. But basically, white has a way to start an initiative which does not die out until black resigns. So how do you start an initiative in a position which is, I don't know, looks moderately closed, no pieces are interacting? How can you possibly start an initiative here? F4, F4 is a way to, I don't know, lose a pawn maybe? Yeah, I mean, I, the thing is, I, I like that you're trying to do something. It's, uh, but the problem is that it needs to, first of all, it not needs to just lose a pawn, but also you need to have a clear idea. Like, yes, your bishop gets out, but I mean, I don't think you're doing anything too special. And knight, the knight wants to come to f4 anyway, right? So probably f4 doesn't, isn't in your best interest, I would say. Yep. Rook a d1. Rook a d1 is a nice building move. But when I say start an initiative, I'm not usually looking for a building move. I'm looking for which type of move. And those of you who are here for my last lecture should know this. Knight d5? Knight d5 is a move which I like. You're trying, you're attacking the queen. You're going to create a nice pawn duo here. This move looks excellent, right? But OK, you're giving up a whole piece. And again, it's not entirely clear what's going to happen. For example, say I play knight f4. You can play d6. I move here. There's nothing. It's just not quite there yet. You know what I mean? It's one of those things where you look at it and you go, maybe it's dangerous, but not, not quite here. So you want to store this knight d5 idea in your mind because it's a really powerful potential, right? You sacrifice a piece for these two monster pawns. But at the moment, you just don't have enough avenues into the position. You know what I mean? So I would say that. You have the great idea, but you need to prepare it a little first. Aha. Okay. Uh -huh. And this move is very, very strong. So b4 is the natural reply, which was played in the game. But just to show you how things can go horribly, horribly wrong really fast, let's say black plays bishop b7, which also looks fairly normal, right? You can take, take, rook a1. So again, I mean, you can't really do too much here. So bishop comes back. And already, it's just sack city. Bishop takes b5 is fine, but I like the even more forcing knight takes. Check. So what's going to happen? I mean, rook's coming down here with c6. You, you have two pawns for the piece, so it's not like you're even down that much material. After here, rook a7 anyway. You're threatening rook takes bishop. You're threatening c6. The end is near. And it happened so fast, right? It happened right out of the opening. You're thinking, knight f8 was played. How can this move possibly be this bad? But when you're behind a development and your opponent's ready to kind of come at you, you have to be very careful. So already you can see the dangers in this position. Black played b4, which, at least to my mind, is the most challenging move by far. So of course he didn't do this to move the knight back to a2, I hope. What did white play? Boom. But what's the difference between this and knight d4, d5 in the other position? e4 uh, e4 is still kind of the same, I think. B4. Oh, b4, yes. I was about to say, yeah. Figured you meant b4. b4 is now weak, and you have open lines now, right? Your bishop's now more open. The queen side's more open. It's just a lot more annoying for black to play now. There's also a tactical reason, which we'll come to in the game. So. White sacrifices a piece, gets this nice pawn duo. And the funny thing about this is, I wouldn't say Greg is exactly, I wouldn't call him an initiative, I wouldn't call him a super aggressive player. I'd say he's more of a positional player. But when you present any strong player in a certain position, you know, somehow the blood gets pumping and you're like, wait, this position shouldn't be right. Something should fall apart here. And he saw this move knight f8 and was like, ah, oh, there should be a way to start an initiative. So sometimes it's not even about like, OK, if Tal were playing this game, you'd be like, of course he sees knight d5, right? But sometimes it's really, you know, there's, there's a nice continuation. And regardless of which type of player you are, you come at it. 
But, okay, we have this nice pawn duo, but you're still down a piece. So the question is, what does black do? So black played f5. So this move looks kind of loose, but at the same time, it makes sense, because white wanted to play knight e4 to d6 as one idea, right? And now this move gives the king an escape route, potentially. It controls knight e4. And the queen now kind of can slide around on the, on the second. So this move really makes sense, right? It's a normal defensive move. So OK, white continues to push. d6, why not? So queen c6 was played in the game, which again, to my mind, is the most natural move. Instead of that, queen d7 could have been played. And here, white has a really nice continuation. And it's definitely not obvious when you first look at it. So take a moment. Yeah? Bishop b5 is a cool idea, but after I play pawn takes, pawn takes, I can take your rook, right? I mean, you're giving away another piece, so you need something pretty strong for it. I would say this is a cool looking idea, but after takes, 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 takes. I mean, don't get me wrong, you still might have an initiative, but I'm taking lots of pawns and pieces, right? You're down lots of pieces. So even if I have to ditch a bishop and move my king here, I might survive, no? So you have to be careful. I mean, I know it's easy, it's easy to sack someone else's pieces that aren't your own. But pretend for a moment they're your own pieces, and you care about their well-being, and you don't want to give them up without a good reason. So bishop b5, I like it. It's aggressive, but maybe too much. But you're remembering my comment that white sacks all their pieces, aren't you? <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get your chance. All the pieces will be sacrificed in due order. So, yep. Queen d5? Queen d5 is a nice looking move, hitting the rook, right? Threatening c6. But the problem is, I'm not sure what you do after this. Seems like you have to move back. You can, and then I take. You're kinda, your pawns are collapsing in front of you, right? I mean, these positions look so promising always when you're analyzing them. You're like, yeah, pawns push, I'm going to crush. But so often, if you play one inaccurate move, they just fall and you look like an idiot. I know, because I've looked like an idiot on many an occasion. So you have to be very precise with how you push your pawns and when. Is now a good moment to play c6? Is now d queen d5 the most accurate? c6 is a nice move, but what happens after queen takes pawn? Free pawn. What was your idea? Maybe bishop b5? Bishop b5 is, is kind of nice, but you can actually do something much simpler, which is rook here. The problem is this queen has no squares. Where does it go? Play yep. So for example, if the queen goes here, I play rook c7. You have to go to b8, which is just kind of disgusting, if you ask me. And now your queen d5 move, threatening queen f7, threatening queen c6, I think that uh, white's Black, black's about to collapse, right? So you see how just this one move order thing can really be, because it looks weird. You're giving up one of your connected pawns. But once the rook gets into c7, it's just really, really bad. So white, black understandably played queen here. But now we can revisit one of our favorite ideas, especially by a particular person in this audience. Yes. Quite a move, right? So you have to take, pawn takes. But now the problem is you don't have time to take this rook because your queen's under attack already. So black actually does take this pawn and gives up the rook, which is understandable because, again, one of the things when you're defending is you can't be too greedy when you're defending. And anyone who's going over Morphe games knows this. <laughs> if you take all your opponent's pieces, probably you'll get brutally checkmated. So at some point, you have to learn to give material back, which is what he does. The problem is if you try to hang on to everything, White just shoves the pawns down black's throat, and the game is basically over right away. For example, if queen b5 now, d7 check, and then rook takes a8, and then takes on d7, and every piece falls, and then you probably get checkmated anyway. If queen b8, b6, and I don't have to tell you that this is not pretty. Uh, three, three pawns on the sixth. I don't know what it's worth, but it's probably more than a queen. <laughs> so yeah, don't, don't do it. Don't do it, guys. Uh, and yeah, if, if rook takes here, which is probably the best defense, 
you're still down a queen. And after knight d3, which is a nice move heading for c5, it's going to be pretty bad. So even though you have a rook and two pieces for the queen, because the black king's here, because these pieces are basically just sitting here as spectators, um, white still has a crushing attack. So that's why he took on b5. So white took the rook, queen c6. And then white played what? Rook fa1 is a very natural move. But I have a question for you. What happens after f4? Did you see this coming? It's important to see peace trapping moves before they happen. This is one of those things. The question is, how do you save your bishop? You can, or I should say you may, or both. What happens if I take your bishop? This looks pretty promising. But do keep in mind that you're still down some pieces, right? So let's say I play, I don't know, knight d7 maybe? So I'm going to try to castle, perhaps. I assume it's still legal, right? I haven't moved my king? Yeah. So I always have to check, because I always forget this. You're laughing at me, but... I often will think, wait, can I castle here? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this is promising, but I don't think it's super clear. I think you can do better. Bishop d4, I'll take it. I'm not proud. Hmm? So now you want rookie one? Well, you gotta make a decision, come on. Either way, I'm running, I'm, I'm running. Putting on the tennis shoes and jogging away. Keep in mind, if I get too far, I can start sacking material back, which isn't what you want, right? So, again, you can see how you have to be very precise with all this. Um, but white found a much more aggressive and interesting move. But the question is, why? Now, black played knight d7, which is a much better defense. But why did black not take this bishop? There are two answers, by the way. One is the cool answer. And the other is the boring, you know, also good answer. So if you know what's good for you, you'll find the cool answer. Very nice. You found the cool one, bam. Because you can take this knight, but after I recapture, you have a real problem. Because <laughs> you can't take the queen because of mate, everyone sees that. And the problem is, what do you do if you don't take the queen? What's your move? Let's say I play, I don't know, here, out of desperation. Take the queen, that's boring. Yeah, take the queen. Ridiculous. No, taking the queen, I'm sure, is fine. But come on, now what? That's the way you end a chess game. Luckily for us, black defended a little bit better. And I say luckily, because then we get to see white sack the rest of the pieces. Oops. So black played knight d7, which is a much better move. So what now? You like this move, I can tell. You know I can castle, right? Oh, we go. I think so. Let, we're about to, f my moment of truth, whether I, I realize it's possible. Yes, I knew it was possible. Okay. And your bishop's still trapped, by the way. Huh? <laughs> Not to laugh at you. I'm kind of laughing at you because it's funny. But yeah, the bishop on d4 is still trapped. So unfortunate. Rook takes d7. Rook takes d7 is possible. 
What's your idea after I play? I guess I'll take with queen. All right, I'm just taking everything. Give it. I want it all. I want it now. Yeah, this is this is a this is a tact, a t an attacking temptation which I myself fall into all the time. Also, I just want to give away all my pieces to checkmate. The problem is, if you give away all the pieces you need to checkmate, you don't have any checkmating pieces left. You're just left with you know a sad king and a knight and a bishop, and you're done. So you have to make sure you don't give away too much. I realize white gave away all the pieces eventually, but you have to make sure you do it at the right time. So you have the right idea. You, you should be trying something aggressive. Because the problem is, if you allow black to castle, and I'm sure this is what black was counting on in the game, you're in big trouble, right? So you need a way to prevent this. Yes. Now the queen prevents castling. And queen e6 check is a pretty nasty threat, right? So. Black took on e3. Yeah, knight hf6 doesn't really help you because you check and you play knight e4. And this is a really nice move. So the idea is, let's say I play pawn takes bishop. What do you do now? Hmm? OK, but I can defend with queen e8. Nice. See that? So you're pinned, and then next move is queen here, mate. Almost no matter what. Maybe knight b8, I'll take it first. But now you're done. This is checkmate, right? Pin, pins, are, pins are nasty people. So you can see how it's very hard to defend against all these threats. Black decided, well, I got to take something. So queen e6 was played. This is maybe the one move of Greg's in the whole game which I disagree with. And it wins. It actually does win. But I think that after knight d3, black can just resign. <laughs> because, like, what do you do? Queen e6 comes next. I take your knight. c6 might come. You can't castle for legal reasons. Talk to my lawyer about it. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's just... Your position is just resignable. However, I have to be fair to him that the way he played it, it's way cooler. So forget about what's objectively the easiest. We're going to go with what's cool, because we're all cool people. So queen e6 check, and he played rook takes d7. So again, knight e4 is a very easy win. But again, I kind of like the way he did it. So pawn takes knight check. So what do you play now? If you play king takes, I play queen takes c5 check. If you go here, I give you check again. Can't go to e2 because of knight f4. If you go here, I give you check again. Give you check again. Check. Check. Who's going to get mated? <laughs> White's going to get mated probably, right? Either way you go, you're almost certainly, something bad will happen to you. I hate to say it. So you have to be careful. And this is why I kind of like knight d3, because it avoids all the pitfalls. Luckily, white is in no way obligated to take that pawn. But you see how easy it would be to play one careless move, and your beautiful masterpiece goes out the window. So the whole game, you have to be so focused and calculating accurately every move to avoid it. Now, you, could, you don't have to calculate that much. After king takes f2, ki queen takes c5, I would just be like, oh no, I'm not doing this. I wouldn't calculate any further. But the key is to see that queen takes c5 is now check, and that black can get out of it, right? It would be an easy blunder to make if you're not paying attention. So black now plays queen e8. There are quite a few possibilities here, though. For example, queen a6 check was possible. And after king takes eight to f2, which is forced, queen e2 check. Easy to miss this one, isn't it? Very good. Taking is the best move. Check. So say back to f1. Takes. Keep in mind, you're down two pieces still. The game is not just over. And believe it or not, in this position, and I, I think he saw this during the game. He, he, he calculated a lot. Um, 
there's only one move to win here, and every other move loses. So finding the winning move is super important, let's just say. Yes? Huh? Oh, that's cute. Okay. I give you props for cuteness on the move. Uh, the problem is, what happens if I take it? And then I go here? What's material? Who would you, whose position do you prefer? You think so? And where is it going? Let's say I do nothing the rest of the game. Where's this pawn going? Then? Ah, some wishful thinking there. The problem is, because this square is so well guarded, you're going to have a hard time winning this. Now, maybe you're not just dead lost, but I would say that black is the one maybe trying to win. Because my rook's going to come out, eventually I'm going to try to win this pawn. Do I think it's necessarily a win? Maybe not. But this is not a clear win for white, is it? So white actually has a much better move. You guys just want to give away all your pieces. I don't know. It's some kind of disease. All right, king takes. Which one? Bam. I am taking that in two seconds. And you've sacked all your pieces, so one goal's been accomplished. But uh, I don't think you're going to win this game. Not unless your opponent drops dead at this particular moment. So, I think you're thinking in ter too much in terms of aggression here. Think in terms of what piece is preventing you from just winning here. I heard something good. Yes. The only move that just wins. Because now the knight's attacked, and if it moves anywhere, then c7, d7, and those pawns are pretty nasty, right? Um, but okay, let's say, so, yeah, th this is winning. Let's say I go here. I want you guys to show me how it's winning. Don't just take my word for it. I, I lie all the time. Okay, and if king h7. See, one careless move. It can cost you the whole game. Because now if you play d7, I just take, and you're just down a piece. I know it's this sad looking bishop, but it's still a whole piece. So you're probably going to lose. You can try this and hope and pray I take your rook. But I'm afraid, but obviously I'm going to sidestep. And again, when you're down this, and this is the thing, you, you, you have to be, you can never get complacent in these games. When you're sacrificing all this material, it's fun, there's a wild ride, but it's very important you look at how can my opponent sack material back? Because Black can sack back a whole piece and still be completely winning. So you have to make sure these guys queen. And not only do they queen, black doesn't have too many pieces for the queen. So what did you want to play? So you want d7 instead. All right. So what if I play... I have to take a moment here. OK, so what if I play knight takes d7? King H7. Ha! Yes! Foiled. Aha. This is a better option. Because now if I let you trade rooks and you play C7, that's a queen for two pieces. That's too much material, right? So I have to try to block, but now you still play C7. So you see what I mean? It's not that hard, but you have to take that extra moment to find the accurate move. If you don't find the accurate move, and imagine how easy, by the way, it would be to miss queen a6 and then queen e2 check. Not so, not, so easy to, not so easy to see. So you have to be on the lookout for tempo moves all the time and make sure you're calculating accurately to the very end. Because a masterpiece can turn into a disaster really fast. Um, there's a reason why there's probably more disasters than there are masterpieces. A masterpiece is rare. A uh, blown masterpiece is very common. So uh, knight g3 check is another move which is important to see. So you have to take it. Otherwise, if king takes, queen takes c5. Queen takes d7. Keep in mind, I was threatening mate on f7, so I didn't have time to recapture. So what do you do now? Well, this move is fairly easy. 
Okay. So you're up a queen, but look at this. Those are pretty powerful pawns, wouldn't you say? Or no? You're not intimidated by these pawns. I don't know. Everyone's intimidated by different things. So how do you win here? Queen where? OK, if you go queen d8, I'll go up here. OK. Well, this would transpose. Yeah, this this would be the other variation. You could have just done it in, in without a move. Like queen d8 is an extra move. That's all. So here you have two choices. I can play bishop f8, and what now? Do not allow rook h1 check, please. That is what? This? Uh, I just have one question. How are you going to queen? <laughs> it's OK. Happens to all of us. Um, you had a much simpler one, though. Sometimes it's easy to look for kind of cool solutions because we've been looking at sacrifices and doing cool things. Sometimes it's just a simple move. And you, when you're playing a masterpiece, I know you wanna, you, there's this tendency to want to finish in glamorous style. Sometimes you just have to take pieces and have your opponent resign. It's just the way things go. Yeah. yeah. Now rook h1 does nothing, right? Now rook h1, you just calmly take this pawn and ask black to resign. So yeah, now, now the game is pretty much over. Uh, but what happens if black plays king h7? I block my rook, but I don't know. Still doing stuff. Yeah, now you can actually d7 is probably even easier. I think this wins too, though. Because now if king takes, you play here and you queen. So it should be fairly easy. But d7 is, is also a nice way to do it. And the game is over. So. Uh, those options didn't work. But you saw how knight g3 and queen a6 were close to working, right? You had to be very precise to get rid of those options. So no matter what's happening in a game, again, precision is so important. In the game, black played queen here. So what now? Rook d8. All right, are we playing the peace giveaway variation again? What's going on? C6. OK, do you have an immediate threat? Not really. So you're hoping I have no defensive move here, is what you're saying? I mean, I could play queen out and trying to check you. If Remember, once I start checking you, you're probably done, right? So once I play here, you better have like checkmate immediately. Seven. All right, check. Seven. Check. I offer a draw, but only to save time. What did you want? Aha, uh -huh. very nice. Yeah, I mean, a move like this looks really cool, but now you allow queen check again. And then the circus starts all over, right? And in this case, the circus is a bad thing. I'm not saying circuses are always bad, but when you're winning, a circus is bad. So rook f7 check. Giving away the rook. I told you you're sacrificing all the pieces. You guys didn't believe me, I know, but it's OK. So you have to take, right? Now what? Mm-hmm. Very nice. So if, queen t if takes the queen, which is, I mean, if you take the queen, it's actually a similar version to the game, except the rook doesn't get out. So this is actually a very easy win, because you do something like this, right? Check, king somewhere awful, most likely. I guess here, and then you continue to push the pawn. And it's just th these pieces are so bad, they can't really do much, right? The problem with extra pieces is you need them to actually do something. A rook, bishop, and knight is theoretically better than a queen. But if they're looking like this, which, I mean, I don't know what to describe them as. Uh, cobwebs, maybe? I don't know. But they're not good. 
So if the pieces can't do anything and you're just ready to queen, the fact that black has extra material is meaningless. But black found a better move, which is king f7, because at least now the rook gets in the game, right? So the question is, how does white finish, finish things? How can white continue to, to do things? Queen where? OK. So let's say I move my king back here. Rook e7 was played in the game. But let's say I move back here. How are you going to win? So you want to queen your pawn, eh? I have Canadian roots. Uh, all right, I'll play e4. OK. And now, here. I mean, it's legal. I mean, I don't know. I'll take. OK. That's sound logic. So here. OK. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you have a problem. Knight takes g3 is coming, right? Yeah, I don't know why you played g3, though. It didn't look necessary. I, I think that, once again, you kind of got seduced by I have to do things in the cool way. I mean, I'm pretty sure this is a fairly easy win. Yes, I get to sack the bishop, but I mean, the, the knight and rook sometimes can hold against the queen, but they're so disconnected here that I have serious doubts about this ever happening. But again, maybe it was a possible defense. And maybe you could have done things a little better. I mean, I'm not sure if, e -C if c7 here works. My guess would be that this is maybe allowing too much. But because, OK, you can't queen here, obviously, because I check and queen. And that's embarrassing. Um, but maybe even here, you can take king moves, king e2, king e and be slightly fancier about it. But I don't, again, I, sometimes you just have to win in the simple way. In this case, black played rookie seven, which makes sense, right? It's a temple move, hitting the queen. Very nice. I sack all your pieces. But this is a cool resource, right? And this is a type of move where often if you miss a move like this, your win is gone. Now, I'm not saying for sure that's the case here. But in a lot of cases, if you don't play c6, like if you don't find this most accurate move, you end up queening a move slower. And again, when you're dealing, like once these pieces, like say you take this pawn, right? Now I play e4 again. Probably you take. I play bishop here. I cover this square. My knight comes in next move. All of a sudden, the game's a mess. It's not clear at all, right? So you have to spot the c6 resource the minute it comes. Because it not only paralyzes the rook, but now, I mean, if black tries to take, you're ready to queen. But typically, especially if you're facing a GM, or a strong player, they're not going to let you win so easily. They're going to try to find every possible resource to prevent you from winning. So black found e4, which is by far the best move. So the question is, what do you do? Do you play c7? Do you take on e4? Do you take on b4? Do you resign? Plenty of options. Well. Then knight f4 check? Yeah. Well, that's not good. Not saying all your moves are wrong, but you got to be careful. You got to spot what to do after e3. If you don't know what to do after e3, there are some real issues, right? Okay. Don't tell me what I'm going to do. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I, I will play e3, sure. Check. 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 Pawns. Pawns. Yes, uh, they're, they're pointing out I can take the queen, which is true. I just wanted to be kind of more mean about it, but yeah. Okay. And now. You have to be careful, right? Yeah. So this is very important. e4 makes a threat. 
the threat is rook takes queen and bishop e5. So regardless of how aggressive you're feeling, how awesome you're feeling, yeah, I'm sacrificing all my pieces, I'm about to win, make sure you ask yourself, does my opponent have a threat? Rook takes queen followed by bishop e5 most certainly qualifies as a threat. So you know that your move has to address this threat, right? Pawn takes e4, does that address the threat? No. So, so don't do it. It's very important that you address black's threat. F4 might be possible, but then I play e3. So I think you were on to something the first time. What else are you going to play besides c7? The question is, how do you deal with this threat? OK, and up key. Yeah, I know. Uh, so what White did was, I've known Greg a long time. I played against him, I think, three times maybe, four times, something like this. I've seen him play. I have almost never seen him not in time trouble around move 40, ever. <laughs> he almost certainly had two seconds on his clock and was blitzing his moves out. So he does a very common GM thing, which is they just repeat moves. If you are someone who gets into time trouble all the time, first of all, don't do it. It's, I can tell you, for, in, Greg's, in Greg's case, it's cost him tons of games. Like, it's probably cost him tournaments. It's cost him lots of things. Because he just, he, he's a perfectionist in a lot of times. He likes to use up all his time. If you don't have time, it, it hurts you. But when you don't have lots of time in particular, it's nice to repeat moves a lot of the time. Which is, you go back and forth. If you're playing with 30 second increment, guess what? You have an extra minute if you play those moves instantly. Pretty cool, huh? You have an extra minute to think and you're two moves closer to time control. But you have to be very careful. And what do you think you have to be careful of? Yes, which brings me to another funny story. <laughs> I had one game where I was playing against Greg himself, believe it or not, Greg Serper, and I was suffering as black the whole game. It was terrible. <laughs> it was, I had, I think it was an isolated pawn. I played it badly. He was just messing with me the whole game. It was terrible. Like, I just had, a, had an awful, awful position. But it was coming up on move 40, and he didn't have time, like you always. And guess what? He repeated that third time. <laughs> so rather than torturing me for another two hours in the ending, or just winning, I, I think that the position was objectively drawn, but he, could, he would have played it forever. I mean, it would have been horrible. He ended up just giving up an easy draw. So the repeating twice is a great strategy, but make sure you don't do it a third time. And keep in mind, it's easy to do sometimes because the rule is not that you have to do it in a row. All you have to do is reach the exact same position with the exact same person to move three times. And it's a draw. You could do it non-consecutively. And it's important to understand this rule. So. I'd say if you can learn anything from Greg as a player, learn this game and learn not to repeat three times. <laughs> These are the two great things that he can teach you. No, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, I, I would say be very careful of this. So king f7, and now he took. And queens. And at this point, it's still, you know, it's fairly easy cleanup, but it's still, you, you still want to be accurate. So for example, if bishop d4, how would you play here? Hmm? You've passed move 40. Don't, don't bother. It's a nice looking move. Because this bishop doesn't really have a happy home, does not it? Can't really go back. So this would be a very nice move. Because if it takes here, there's a fork. If bishop here, there's a fork. If bishop here, there's a fork. It would have to move away, and then you can just grab. So he defends his pawn with h6. And again, this is another thing. Don't resign too quickly. I know it's a queen for two pieces, but you have two pawns here. And if your bishop can defend these pawns, it's not going to be so easy to win. So even here, even though white's done almost all the work, white sacked every single piece, <laughs> gotten a queen, 
the game should be over. The game's not over until you really make sure it's over, until they are either completely hopeless position, until you checkmate. So make sure you don't lose concentration at any point. So bishop h6, how do you finish the game? He played queen c5. He wants to take a pawn, right? Queen c7 just gives check. I don't really see what it does other than that. That's maybe possible. Yeah. So again, there are a few possibilities. He played back to e8. Taking the pawn immediately might be possible. I wonder if there was something he was afraid of here. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes there are more. There's more than one way to, you know, to to do it, right? It's not always there's only one one winning solution. But I'm guessing that he wanted the king on a certain square, or he wasn't sure. In any case, he gave a few checks and took this pawn. So it's kind of a clever thing. And, and I guess if the king goes back to f7, he maybe checks again and then takes. I'm not exactly sure. Keep in mind, when you reach the end of the game, there tend to be more than one ways. There tend to be more than one way. The key is that you make sure you don't blunder. Which brings me to this question. After queen takes g6, what move do you have to make sure you spot? Yep. And now, which pawn do you take? Right. Don't walk into the fork. And now here. And now he resigns. Because he's not obligated to take this pawn. But imagine how easy it would be to miss a move like e2 check, to miss a move like bishop e3 check. So to the very end of the game, you have to be extremely cautious and make sure you're seeing things well. So again, uh, really a, a neat game. This is, um, I mean, it was played in 1993, so it was a while ago. But I really think that this game is just an excellent game and really could be in any of the best attacking game books. Um, and not only because it was executed precisely, because there were lots of different motifs, but because, I mean, every single piece was sacked. I, again, even in tile games, I can't remember a game where he sacked every piece. Uh, so it's very, uh, definitely a cool game. I've actually had the privilege of seeing Greg lecture about this game himself live um, to a camp. I sat in pretending I was a student so I could watch him present this game. Um, I only hope I was able to do it justice because it, it definitely deserves a lot of respect. It's a really one of the coolest games I've ever seen for sure. And you guys should get right on memorizing it. because. Yeah.